Uh, the reading this morning, as, as, as you've heard, is Ecclesiastes chapter 11. It's not a long chapter, so I'll go through it verse by verse. But um, as a text, I'm using uh, a verse from Exodus 20, verse 27. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for they, the Lord will not hold him guiltless, but taketh his name in vain. Ecclesiastes 11 is, to my mind, one of the most prominent chapters in the whole of the Bible about witnessing and about evangelism. But who is this chapter speaking to? Is this just for those involved in outreach ministry, in evangelism, or is it speaking to all believers? Witnessing isn't something that we should consider as an option. It's something that every believer is committed to do. The text of this morning's message states that the Lord will not find his guiltless to take his name in vain. Contrary to popular understanding, this verse doesn't refer to those who use the name Jesus Christ as an expletive when they are angry. In fact, Christ is not the Lord's name. He would have been known as Yeshua ben Joseph, Yeshua, or Jesus, the son of Joseph. But the Bible also reveals him as Yeshua ben David, Jesus, the son of David. The word Christ actually means anointed one, or Messiah. But by claiming to be Christian, we are in fact identifying ourselves as followers of Christ. We have therefore taken his name upon ourselves. John 12, 32, Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Wherever the gospel of Jesus is spoken, in witness, or preached on the streets, or from the pulpit, by born-again believers, the Spirit of God will work in the hearts of those who hear the word, if it is preached in truth. Some may then come to believe, but many will unfortunately reject the word. But we have to give them the chance and the opportunity to do either, by lifting the Lord's name to others, by preaching the word, or even just witnessing one to one. But it shouldn't be our concern whether they choose to believe or not. We just have to play our part and tell people about Jesus and the way to eternal life through him. Amen. Our personal commitment and responsibility will then be fulfilled, but the actual saving of their souls is the Lord's work, Amen. through his Spirit. So therefore Christians should never be discouraged if they don't see results. If we play our part, the Lord is obligated to play his part. He is the one who will build the house, and he uses our witness when we preach his name to others. Isaiah 32.20 says, Blessed are ye that sow besides all waters, that send forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass. The message of salvation through Christ alone has to go out to the whole world, and the Lord will use all sorts of workers to do it in all sorts of ways. These are signified by the ox and the ass, workers who carry the good news to all lands. The nations are signified by the term waters. How will believers find the way, unless we are obedient to our Lord by telling them? Romans 10, 13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Jesus also said in Mark 8, verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. These words of our Lord apply to all who believe. We are obligated and we must tell others that Jesus is the only way to salvation and only those who believe on him can and will be saved. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 it says, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Now, does this mean we should take a trip down to the boating lake or to the canal to feed the ducks? I don't think it does. So I think that casting bread upon the waters must apply to something totally different. As far as it is possible, I'm very much a believer in a literal, trans a literal interpretation of God's word. If the word makes sense of a literal interpretation, then we shouldn't try to translate it in any other way. But none of us can deny that there are certain verses that have an allegorical or symbolic meaning. But I believe the Lord gives us wisdom to rightly divide the word of truth. 
I'm sure that the bread in this verse actually means Jesus, the bread of life, the bread that comes down from heaven, that he who eats of this bread will never hunger. We are instructed that this bread should be cast upon the waters. There are symbolic meanings to the seas or the waters in various parts of the Bible, particularly in the book of Revelation that we've been studying with Pastor. I believe the waters here describe to all nations and tongues, as it also did in the verse from Isaiah that I just read. Every part of the world is where we should be casting this bread. We certainly have a mission field here in Wales, and indeed in all the UK. But we also have a mission to either go to other lands to share the gospel, or to financially support those who do. Those who try to reach the lost in the farthest parts of the earth need our support. They can't function without the help of the church. We are promised that if we cast this bread, it will return to us after many days. We are talking about the bread of life, not the soggy bread that the ducks have rejected. As we all very well know, the UK, and Wales in particular, are now lands of spiritual darkness. Anyone who participates in open-air evangelism will often get to meet people who have come here from all over the world to preach the gospel of Christ on the streets of our country. Years ago, we sent missionaries from Wales and the UK to every part of the world. Now they're coming to us. Mm -hmm. Two missionaries from Australia joined us in Cardiff two weeks ago when we were there to preach. There's a crown waiting in heaven for those who will win souls. So either of these could be ways that our bread returns to us after many days. Daniel 12.3 says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. Verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 11 tells us, Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Again, the seven and the eight are numbers with a spiritual or typological meaning. It gets a little tricky from here, so please bear with me. There definitely is a spiritual significance in certain numbers in the Bible, and that's why they keep recurring again and again. Give a portion to seven. The number seven is often typological. It's a number that appears commonly in many parts of the Bible, such as the seven days of creation. The earth was created in six days, but then God rested on and sanctified the seventh day, which God gave to the children of Israel as a Sabbath. Further to this, and according to the Orthodox Study Bible, 777 represents the threefold perfection of the Trinity. As 777 can be contrasted against 666 or 666, the number of the beast. I would personally assume that giving a portion to 7 is alluding to doing a complete work and not resting until it's done. But we shall also give a portion to 8. The number 8 in the Bible signifies resurrection and regeneration. The number signifies a new beginning. The number eight is seven plus one. And since it comes just after seven, which itself signifies an end of something, so eight is also associated with the beginning of something new, <coughs> a new era or a new order. I was saying to Brother Derek just a short while ago that in my mind the church doesn't meet on the first day of the week. God rested on the seventh day, but Jesus said his father is always working. So what did God find to do on the eighth day? The day of Christian worship is the first day of the new week, or the eighth day. This makes sense to me anyway. Christ rose on a Sunday and a church was born on a Sunday. Seven Sabbaths plus one day, Pentecost. So our worship is on the first day of the new week, or the eighth day, which I see as the day of the new creation. In Christian numerology, the number 888 represents Jesus, or sometimes more specifically, Christ the Redeemer. This representation may be justified either through gematria, by counting the letter values of the Greek transliteration of Jesus' name, or again, as an opposing value to 666, the number of the beast. Six is the number of man whom God created on the sixth day. And here's an interesting fact on the number eight in Hebrew. A Jewish baby boy is circumcised on the eighth day of his life. This is a spiritual pointer or type to being born again, a cutting away of the flesh, and living a new life in the spirit. But something that isn't generally known about circumcision on the eighth day is really amazing. The eighth day is the only day of a male infant's life when the body produces a flood of vitamin K, which promotes rapid healing. 
God knows exactly why he gives all his instructions and commands. We should never doubt or disbelieve things we don't readily understand. His thoughts and ways are much higher than ours. So, as we can see, Ecclesiastes 11 verses 1 and 2 are pregnant with spiritual meaning for those who will understand. And I hope I haven't put anyone to sleep yet, because the rest of the verses of Ecclesiastes 11 will be much simpler and easier to understand. Verse 3 says, If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall towards the south, or towards the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. We should be like those clouds, blowing across the land and sea by the wind of God's Spirit, pouring out the water of God's Word over the whole earth. But the next part of the verse about the tree falling is something I struggle to understand for quite a few years. One evening on the street ministry in Newport, my dear brother Spikey came to me and he said, John, did you hear about that young lad in Pill who was accidentally killed when he was shot in the head with an air rifle by his brother? I replied, yes. I read about it in the newspaper. Spikey then said that he'd been speaking to his brother that very day. And he asked Spikey to pray for his dead brother. I asked Spikey how he'd reply to him. Spikey said, your brother's gone. So it's too late. But I'll pray for you instead. The brother then pleaded, no, no. Please pray for my dead brother. Wow. As Spikey told me this, I received a flash of revelation from the Lord. If the tree fall towards the south, or towards the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. We all get problems with verses of scripture that we don't readily understand, but we should read them anyway, because the Lord won't bring them back to us in his own way when he's ready, if, if we haven't read them. He can't bring them to our minds if we haven't read them and thought about them. Every person living is like that tree. When the tree falls, it's dead. And when we take our last breath, we are dead too. But if we die in Christ, we're in Christ forever. But if we die outside of Christ, we are lost forever. This is why we are obligated and have a duty to speak to non-believers every opportunity we get. Our witness may be their last chance to hear the gospel of salvation. Nobody knows when they will take their last breath. I have to admit that sadly I fall short of this myself. In my earlier Christian days, I was so zealous and on fire that I would try to create opportunities <coughs> and force doors open every chance I could get. Now, however, I wait for the Lord to open doors for me and pray that I'll be ready to respond if he creates an opportunity. I do admit, though, that witnessing isn't so easy these days. People were more open and receptive ten years or so ago than they are today. Ecclesiastes 11.4 he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. This verse clearly means that it's all too easy to make excuses about whether we will witness or preach, or even whether we feel like coming to church. We are expected by the Lord to follow his commandments and instructions. Don't forget the text of this sermon was about our guilt if we take the Lord's name upon ourselves in vain. Witnessing is essential. But the assembly of the saints is not an option either. It's an instruction to us all. 2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We are under obligation to go and to do as the Spirit leads us and not to be influenced by our own personal feelings. Ecclesiastes 11.5 as thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. This verse is illustrated so beautifully in Psalm 139, which describes how God sees a, a child forming and developing in the mother's womb. He can even see that child as it would be as an adult, even before its limbs and features have developed. In a similar way, he is telling us in this verse that we can't see what's happening inside a person when we give them the gospel of Christ. But God can see. We just have to tell them and entrust God with the inner workings of salvation and regeneration. We too often look upon the outward appearance that God sees inside. He sees the heart. Mm -hmm. Verse 6. 
In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not which shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Again, this verse shows clearly we shouldn't go by our feelings. Morning or evening, day or night, rain, snow or sunshine, we are called to work. Today is the day of salvation. We should seek to persuade others to call upon the name of the Lord while he's near. We don't know what or which thing we may have said that will reach into their hearts and souls, but the Lord knows exactly what will turn the light on inside when the name of Jesus is preached. I'm taking this next... Uh, section from the NIV. Ezekiel 3.18 When I say to a wicked person you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life that wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways they will die for their sin but you will have saved yourself. And again, when a righteous man turns from their righteousness and does evil, and they put a stumbling block before them, they will die. Since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that person did will not be remembered, and they will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the righteous person not to sin, and they do not sin, they will surely live, because they took warning, and you will have saved yourself, NIV. These verses really are a double-edged sword. Verses 18 and 19 speak of making the sinner aware of his sin and his need to repent and seek the Lord. By doing so, we will not be guilty of that person's blood because we will have told him the way. But verses 20 and 21 speak of a righteous man who falls into sin. That's a believer. If we are faithful and caring brothers and sisters, we should speak to them about their walk with God. We are obligated to try to steer them back onto the right path. But instead many Christians say, who am I to judge? Fallen brothers or sisters can fall ever deeper because we are too nice to give them instructions or warning. Heresies can creep into their lives, which they will often pass on to others who are gullible enough to listen to or follow them. YouTube and Facebook are rife with disobedient and self-seeking Christians trying to amass a following and often by teaching and speaking unbiblical things and heresies. But the Lord would want us as faithful and sincere brothers and sisters to try to win these erring people back to the Lord and to the way of truth. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So if we care, we should try to ensure that this doesn't happen. Proverbs 27, 6 Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Are we being true friends and brothers if we don't show our love and care and concern for them by trying to get them back on the right path again? Verses 7 and 8 of Ecclesiastes. Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. These verses describe the joy of the Lord in a believer's life and how wonderful it is to walk closely in his light. But as we experience the goodness and faithfulness of the Lord, we should remember what he has delivered us from. We all once walked in darkness, but now we are walking in the light with peace and hope and joy. We should pray that the Lord will strengthen us and keep us close, because given the right circumstances, many of us could backslide into darkness again. I remember conversations I used to have with my dear brother George White. Over the years, we put some shocking things in Newport at night. And believe me, when they've been drinking, some of the women behave more cru crudely than the men. Yeah. I told George it would be easy to fall back into sin after things we've seen and heard. I just couldn't get them pictures and suggestions out of my head. George told me that I'm finished with the world. He said I could backslide into sin again but then I would get no peace if the Spirit of God dwells in me. He said, the world is not for you, John, and you were finished with the world. He would then read our scriptures to me, and I just knew that the Lord was speaking to me through George. I thank God for my association with that dear brother, 
And I also thank God for giving me a teachable spirit and for providing me with caring brothers and sisters at various times in my life when I needed them. Verses 9 and 10. I'm reading from the NIV in these two verses. You who are young, be happy while you are young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart, and whatever your eyes see. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart, and cast off the troubles of your body. For youth and vigor are meaningless. Yes, when we are young and in the world, many of us have a lot of fun by doing things that the Lord would never approve of. When the word says that we, we were pulled out of the miry clay, that certainly applies to myself. I'm not going to go into details, but believe me, I lived a sinful life. But unbelievers and sinners are instructed to remove sorrow from their hearts by renouncing and repenting of all the evil things they've done. Then they can come to know the peace that surpasses all understanding. And that we can cast our cares on Jesus and ask him to guard our hearts and our minds too. If we are not truly born again believers, we should beware, because our sins will ultimately find us out. But before we look at others and find their faults, as our brother David said earlier on, the Bible tells each of us to examine ourselves. Yes. We can't take a speck out of a brother's eye if we have a plank in our own eye. But if we really and truly are believers and followers of our Lord Jesus <coughs> Christ, we will know the conviction of the Spirit of God if we are not walking according to His will. If we don't feel that con conviction, then the Spirit is not with us. But I love what Hebrews 6, 9-12 tells us. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown Him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised, NIV. And my prayer for all of us is a beautiful scripture from the book of Hebrews, chapter 20, verse 20. Now the God of peace, the God again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Won't it be wonderful to hear those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Amen. But before I, before I step down, a couple of days ago, I was lying in bed, and uh, it was about five, half past five in the morning, and I just couldn't sleep, and I, these spiritual numbers that I was talking about just kept going through my mind over and over and over again, and I knew there was something else that the Lord was trying to show me. Anyway, further thoughts on the numbers six, seven, and eight. Jesus was crucified and died on the Friday. Friday is the sixth day of the week. Six is the number of man. The sixth letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Vav. It has a numer numerical value of six. The letter Vav is shaped like a Roman nail. There's a letter Vav. And the word for Vav, or word for nail in Hebrew, is also Vav. In most cru crucifixions, four nails would be used, one in each hand and one through each foot, usually through the ankle, with the victims either side of the with the victim's feet either side of the stake or the post of the cross. But Jesus was crucified with three nails. One nail through each of his hands and one through both of his feet. His one foot would have been laid over the other and the nail would be hammered through both feet from the top or instep of the upper foot and out through the soles of both feet. The numerical value of Bab or nail is six. He was crucified with three nails. 666 was nailed to the cross. 666 is the number of the beast and epitomizes to the extremity of the evil of man which nailed our Lord to the cross. Jesus died and was placed in a tomb on the sixth day, Friday. 
He lay dead in the tomb through Saturday, the seventh day, which is the Sabbath. Seven, as I've already said earlier, means completion or the end of things. This was the end of the Mosaic Covenant and living by the law. Jesus arose from the dead on a Sunday. This marks the start of a new covenant. And spiritually speaking, it's not the first day of the week, but the eighth day, or the start of a new week and a new covenant. The covenant of grace was now in operation from this day. This new covenant was first described by the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 30, 31, verse 31. But even more interestingly, it is proclaimed also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 8, and 8, 13. Hebrews chapter 8, now is that a coincidence? The church was born on a Sunday, seven Sabbaths plus one day, the eighth day. The number eight in the Bible signifies resurrection and regeneration. It's the number of a new beginning. As I've already said, in Christian numerology, the number 888 represents Jesus, or sometimes more specifically, Christ the Redeemer. Another interesting fact is that Muslims worship on a Friday, the sixth day of the week. Six is the number of man. Islam is just a man-made religion. It's not given by God. But the Sabbath, the seventh day, and the Sunday that Christians work on, they worship on, they are days that are given by God. One last thing to think about is that if Jesus had one nail through both of his feet, how big was that nail? It must have been like a railway spike, which needs a sledgehammer to knock it in. Imagine the pain of a nail as big as a as big and as thick as a railway spike being hammered through your hands and your feet. Revealing insights into God's words such as these show us that there are many layers and much deeper things to be revealed in the Bible if we search them out. The Bible, unlike any other so-called holy book, is the word of God and not mm -hmm. the word of man. God bless you all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.